Um, our third speaker will join us by Skype, um, and I might see if... Are you there, Peter? Anyway, he will join us by Skype, P Peter Beresford. So, um, this panel is... Um, our, our idea is to introduce you to the amazing work that's happening in the user, survivor, consumer movement in, um, around the world, where people are developing our own knowledges. So yesterday we were talking about uh, shifting the power dynamic and um, basically if we can, um, and we are building a huge body of knowledge that's been developed from the perspective of service users through research, either involvement in research or especially user uh, survivor led research so that we are designing research according to our own questions, but other ways of Developing. And so MAD Studies has become, no, has become the name that's been given to this, which is a, has developed in, uh, real, al alongside the uh, Critical Disability um, Studies departments, and it has come out of Canada. So you're going to hear about all of this work, and um, I'm really delighted to ask Pagavi Devander to be our first speaker, and she will tell you um, about um, the work of that... Um, that's happening that in, in, through her uh, involvement in India and wider, and where there's a lot of work happening around gender, community organization, and people with um, psychosocial disabilities taking the lead in, in providing their own support. So I'm really delighted to welcome Pagavi Devander. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Namaste. I'm really happy to be here. I'd like to thank Dr. Liz Brosnan for facilitating my presence here at the University of Calvi. I'd also like to thank the organizers, um, particularly Dr. Omahoni, for also bringing me over. Um, really happy to meet a lot of old friends and excited to meet people whose works I've known over the years but haven't had the chance yet to meet them. Um, I have a PowerPoint, but it really says very little. It just catches the key messages that I want to leave you off with. Um, I have a written presentation uh, which I made so that, uh, you know, I make the best use of time that we have and also to enable uh, the uh, multiple communication channels that need to operate uh, in, in an inclusive uh, conference like this. Um, please do feel free to wave if I'm going too fast. Um, I really loved the intervention this morning uh, that uh, someone needs to explain what is psychosocial disability. Um, I bet it came from someone who is very young in the movement um, because in the last three decades of my work within the mental health movement as a, uh, as a radical activist to begin with, but more and more move towards peer support and healing alternatives. So someone who has seen a lot of language issues in how we refer to ourselves. And I do think that there is something historical in the unfolding of these different concepts. Um, so I've said that I've been around for 30 years, which makes me an elder <laughs> in the movement. <laughs> and so I, I say this uh, with a request to, you know, condone the things that I may say, which does not match the present times that we are living in. Um, just a couple of days ago, I saw this survivor film called Crazy Wise. I don't know if some of you got to see it. It's out. No, it's, it's out and it's really, really amazing. Um, it's a great fusion track of the East and the West. It has the personal experiences of people who've been diagnosed with mental disorder. The film largely depicts North Country experiences of being a user or a survivor. But very uniquely, it's not something I've seen in other films before, very uniquely, it draws from the global south in terms of healing methods. 
For example, there are references to shamanistic practices, meditations, extensive use of healing music and rhythm, and community development. I really enjoyed this film because I found this to be a very refreshing reversal of roles in the relationship between the global north and the global south. When we began our work, we used to hear that people in India don't know about the user survivor movement. There needs to be an education for advocacy of user survivors. We need to teach people how to do user survivor advocacy. And we got all of that, we got all of that. Um, and we used it well um, for a while, but it has its limitations. So my talk is really about this exchange between the, the global north and the global south, um, the exchange between people who identify as users and survivors and people who identify as persons with psychosocial disabilities, um, between countries which are driven by uh, oppressive mental health system and countries where there are really no systems and nothing to be oppressed about. Um, so these are the kinds of divides that are shaping um, our debates today. <coughs> so I begin with sharing some of the work we did, very much influenced by um, the user survivor movement for which I remain and Bapu Trust, the organization I represent remains very grateful. I represent these two, I mean, I'm, I've been, I've learned a lot through the Bapu Trust for research on mind and discourse. We are located in Pune. I've learned a lot from my extensive engagement with Asian region uh, leaders um, of persons with psychosocial disabilities, and we call that forum TCI Asia. We decided to choose this name, Transforming Communities for Inclusion Asia, rather than Asian Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. This was a very deliberate choice. And we feel that TCI Asia, as a call for inclusion, of all people with disabilities, and in fact, all vulnerable groups in a more enriched, enlarged vision of society and community. It matches our yearning for what we really want. Um, using the term users and survivors of psychiatry, we feel causes conflict and divide in dialogue. Whereas having, you know, when we go into forums and say we want to you know, put up our rights and we are users and survivors, immediately there a wall builds up. Whereas when we say, we're all in this together, let's build a society for inclusion, and these are what we need to be included, then people have open hearts. So we have found this again and again. So, um, um, but to finish, uh, you know, uh, finish, uh, uh, I would like to finish my point about what we did as user survivors in India, what we did as user survivors in India, and uh, just a point of recall that India is a post-colonial state. We were colonized by the British over several centuries. Um, we carry the indomitable legal traditions that the British left for us. Even though we've had 60 years of independence, the Indian governance has not changed, particularly those systems which relate to the mental health sector. I guess we have this in common with other Commonwealth nations in Asia and possibly elsewhere like South Africa, several countries of Africa. So I guess that you know we would have similar experiences as Commonwealth nations struggling to overcome, overcome the trauma left behind uh, by, uh, by the British legal tradition. Um, we've also looked at the Spanish and the Dutch, but I think the British had the most evolved legal system, uh, administrative legal system, uh, that, that's still operating in many of the uh, Commonwealth colonies, erstwhile colonies. So, in India, when we started the work in mental health advocacy about two and a half decades ago, in the late 1880s and the early 90s. We were very much inspired by movements such as the Mental Patients Liberation Movement, Madness Network News, uh, several, we, in fact, in our library, we, until very recently, we had volumes and volumes of Mad Patient Liberation materials with us. We had poetry, we had 
artifacts, we had these puppets, we had all kinds of stuff signifying the, the mad patients liberation movement. This is, I'm talking about the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. Um, we were very inspired by feminist writers like Germaine Greer, Kate Millett, Simone de Beauvoir, the whole, whole basket of people who were talking about freedom, human freedom in the post-war period. Um, Albert Camus, there were artists like Bertolt Brecht, um, then Paul Riker, Gadamer, the hermeneutic theorists. So we had a lot of influence from the, from the European uh, um, writers on resistance. Uh, the theater of the oppressed. We had all kinds of, uh, of course, uh, Michel Foucault and some of the later writers. Um, and uh, of course, we were also, we loved the music by Bob Dylan, Pink Floyd, and several people who gave us this sense of, you know, um, grief about a lost and a hopeless world, um, having lost uh, vision for community, vision for relationships, vision for family, vision for society, vision for politics. When all that was lost, a lot of really, really beautiful stuff came out. We were happy to hear and process all of this. The call for liberation was the cornerstone of this political resistance. And they were linking with other movements of resistance, particularly women's rights and labor rights. Uh, many, many critiques um, of capitalism, privatization, and the political economy of nationalism. What is holding up nationalist sentiments? Is it all moral or is there some money involved in that as well? Um, I'm not sure in the West, and I'm sure that there are other writers um, here who, who will talk about this. Uh, when that history uh, changed, when ex-patients movements or ex-patients liberation movements became a user-survivor movement, it's really a construct transition uh, in the history of the, uh, you know, in the history of our movement. In the early 90s, there were dozens of exchanges in India, led by the women's organizations, uh, bringing together mad women from different parts of the country. There was a very live and active Mad Women's Exchange, which I was privileged to be a part of. The question at the time was why the women's movement wasn't so empathetic with women who were psychiatrically diagnosed or self-identified as crazy women. We were always on the margins of the women's movement, uh, along with the queer women. A big question for us was whether madness was a subversive response to patriarchy, and whether being in the political movement could actually cure us. Many of us felt that when we were in the thick of an episode, you know, being in the political movement was not really nice, you know, because it added to our stresses. All we needed was a safe, quiet place, you know, to recover and then to think about politics and all of that. Um, but we were constantly challenged on this because uh, there was no empathy for what was going on inside, um, ready to burst all the time. Um, and uh, there was a push to be on the front line of the women's movement. And uh, we, we were not sure if, uh, if we were contributing much. Um, in 2000, we started this, uh, we started two things. One is called Sanchit. It's, uh, um, it's a story collection of mad women. There were also some mad men uh, who wanted to be part of this collective, so we included them. Um, at that time, eminent leaders of the feminist movement who were involved in storying or archiving projects on women's stories, they told us not to pursue the subject of storing mad women because mad women cannot tell their stories. This left a deep impact on us, and so, of course, we had to do it. <laughs> so we collected over 50 of these stories. Some of them got published as papers. It made us understand what is the real world of crazy women, um, and to understand that we need to be really conscious not to homogenize advocacy efforts. There are different goals. People in their lives pursue multiple goals, um, and we cannot put them all in one box. Um, we also started the first mental health advocacy newsletter called Aina, which ran for about eight years. Jaya, I don't know if Jayashri Kalatil is here, but she'll be here soon. She was one of the editors of Aina for several years. The quarterly newsletter published mad poetry 
anti-psychiatry articles, personal testimonies of human rights violations, stories of forced treatment, abuse and violence perpetrated on persons who were identified or stigmatized as mentally ill. Yeah, so that is part one of my story, and I come to the part two. Um, and this captures some of the, uh, you know, visuals of how Aina looks. It's all up on our website for archival interest. Anyone with an archival interest, what's happening in India, uh, you might want to search our website for these issues. Um, so these are some of the poems. I'm afraid I won't have the time to read them, but the one that stayed with me was this. The candle is blown, there is no light. My life was once colored and bright. Now I sit alone and lonely, hoping for someone to come and hold me. I see things that others can't see. I hear voices that keep troubling me. I'm locked in a world for which there is no key. There's someone in my head, and I know it is not me. Yeah, that's Reshma. <sighs> Reshma continues to work on madness experiences. You will find her all over the blog and websites, her poetry, her art. She's awesome. Um, now I want to share some reflex reflections from different projects of the Bapu Trust visiting different sites where people have lived, experiences of psychosocial distress and disturbances. Already in the last few years, once we started hearing people's voices more carefully, we, we, we learned that uh, the user-survivor label or identity is not a cross that every person with a disability wants to carry. It's not a cross that every person who's been through the mental health system wants to carry. People want to live lives. They come in, exit the system, get better, get worse, they follow their tracks and move on. So this is the large number of people uh, who uh, we, have, we have heard, in, in not only in India, but also in the Asian region. So we started questioning whether user-survivor identity is best suited for our region, our culture, and our countries. Um, in 2003, we started a film documentation project visiting indigenous people's communities, collecting their stories of healing by using the methods that they have known and practiced for years. Such methods were varied, starting from chanting Quranic verses, mediumship, being an oracle, clairvoyance, having throes of possession, being inhabited by a variety of entities, and so on. We learned through these studies that communities have pathways of communication with various other non-human entities, sometimes divinities, and this was very much part of people's day-to-day -day experiences of themselves and their society. To have someone else inhabit a body was not disturbing, though it changed people's everyday lives. We met and exchanged with many such voice-hearing people men and women documenting their stories. Um, at that time, for us, these were all mental health phenomena, only expressed in a different way. We thought that the construct of personal disturbance, distress, madness, was the same as possession, inhabitation, and so on. For us, they signified the same thing. However, people who we interviewed did not see it the same way. While a few may express resentment at the way their bodies have been taken over by other non-human entities, many earned respect, felt refreshed and renewed after such episodes. They expressed devotion, not anger, often lifelong devotion to the peer, saint, or goddess that called them. Such tethering of personal distress around a spiritual peg helped them. It was noticeable that in the indigenous healing centers, there was more respect, mutuality of support, family and community participation. And I found resonances of this worldview in the film Crazy Wise. 
I, I owe deep respect to Yeni, who I know is here, comes from a very different uh, country situation about traditional healing. So, you know, I'm sure that we will hear more about that. Um, but this is the India experience. Uh, traditional healing uh, seems to help a lot of people. Another uh, vignette I bring to this discussion, which, is, which, which really talks about diversity of experiences of distress and having multiple boxes or open fluid, you know, flowing structures to capture those experiences rather than a small one of madness. It's not helping. Um, we worked in our slums uh, or what they call basti, uh, low-income communities of Pune since 2004 where we deliver psychosocial peer support and other support services. Um, here too, our madness perspective and, having, and working within individualistic human rights model did not get us very far. We didn't get people to work with, even though we were not providing medicines, nor were we institutionalizing anyone. But there was no relationship with constructs of user, survivor, or madness in the, in the slums. People were just people sharing vulnerability, marginali ma marginalization, and exclusion, and identities linked to those based on poverty, gender, caste, race, language, etc. Even when they were quite evidently disturbed, wandering, or having other extreme states. People in the interviews they gave us talked a lot about the embodiment of distress. Pain, hot, cold, sweating, being tight, loose, burning, churning, tingling, crawling, other more recognizable sensory experiences of mumbling in the ears, buzzing, voice streaming, etc. The language was a different kind of expression of madness, if at all it was experienced as madness. In fact, over a period of time, we have stopped talking about madness as a political or community building construct in the areas where we work. And then the last bit about colonialism, post-colonialism, and the construction of madness. For people like me, I have identity as a survivor. Uh, we are still a very, very small minority in India and Asia. And I contest that uh, with more awareness and education of user survivor politics, we are going to grow in numbers. Bapu Trust has done this for 15 years. Those numbers aren't growing. What we have instead are people with psychosocial disabilities mobilizing hugely in the Asian region and perhaps also you know, our friends from Africa here in the African region. Uh, we are mobilizing around the concept of psychosocial disability. We find our linkages with other groups who are marginalized within the disability groups, particularly the deaf, uh, people with mental intellectual uh, developmental disabilities, with the multiply disabled. So we, we identify a lot in terms of our social experiences and experiences of discrimination and social barriers with these groups. Traveling through Asia, um, we learned that there are countries that do not have mental health laws, and they have no or very few mental asylums, where there are no institutions and no psychiatric services. There are no users, even less survivors, where there is nothing, where nothing exists then this kind of identity development is really difficult. Of course, 10 years down the line, what with globalizing psychiatry, this might change. Um, but we hope and pray for a really strong and vocal and effective cross-disability movement where we are fully included. Uh, madness and resistance constructs do not exist in about half the world, that is the global south. This condition in the Global South of a diversity of political economies surrounding madness is a result of colonialism. Commonwealth in nations in Asia have the old laws and colonial type asylums, but countries which were not colonized and not colonized by the British do not share the same normative framework of regulating the crazy people by putting them away. Yeah, when we discuss this, and this is really my last, um, last intervention here, when we discuss this in our Asia Forum, 
people shared that to talk about being a user of survivor is still a response to the medical treatment system. It is still a du duel between two kinds of polarized voices. What we want is life, and we'll talk to anybody. You know, we will talk to the school teachers, we will talk to the uh, you know general practitioners, we will talk to the social service providers, we'll talk to you know the sports people. We'll talk to everybody, and UNCRPD gives us that option. You look at Article 19 and what it offers through every article of the CRPD. It's it's really amazing. I mean, you you, you can work with anybody and ask for anything. Uh, you know, and it's not just about okay. You know, don't put me away and don't give me these medicines. It's not just that. Um, and so. Um, That's it, I think so, for organizations, I know that I'm running out of time, right? Yeah, so, like the Bapu Trust, this is a good opportunity to raise more and more questions on our politics within the MAD movement and the disability movement, and somewhere along the way, the madness construct has dropped off for us. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bagavi. So without um, more ado, I'm going to call Lucy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to call Kat to come and speak. I'm sorry. I threw everyone into it. So Kat will talk to us. And I should have mentioned before we started that we're going to run through, if it's, it makes sense for us, because we have half an hour, we have time after the coffee break for full discussion with the, pa the whole audience. So we will keep going with the... Um, with the t presentations, and we'll have a full discussion with the audience after, after coffee. Is that okay? So, Kath is um, well known to s some of us here in Galway in, in from the Voices Project, and I'm really looking forward to her um, presentation as well. Kath is based in Melbourne. Um, so we're delighted to hear what she's um, going to tell, present to us this morning. <laughs> Slight technical hitch. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, let me Sorry. Move for a second. I'd also like to thank Dr Liz Brosnan and um, the organisers of this conference. Um, it is an extreme honour actually to be flown halfway around the world to be, to be here and be part of this and to listen to what people have to say. And I'd also like to say to Pargavi that I just got so much out of that. Um, that talk, and I'm interested in the ways that there are maybe some synergies and maybe some. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a. Um, I come from a colonial perspective, so I have to kind of like own it. Um, but yeah, so interested. The title of this presentation, um, I guess I want to explore this idea of being. Can you hear me? I, I realise I might not be. Can, can everyone hear? That's good. Great, excellent. Because <laughs> I could just stand back here and go like that and you wouldn't know what I was saying. Um, so this idea of what mental health le legislation does, how it kind of constructs people, I want to talk a little bit about that. And I also want to talk about um, n this idea of being, actually being um, a person who thought that they were from Venus. That was something that I went through um, and I was only here for the cats. So that's part of my experience. And you'll kind of figure out towards the end what I want to do with that. Um, and I was, I was contemplating this as I was coming back. You have to pay 10 euro to borrow a hairdryer. So anyone who wants to borrow a hairdryer, I'll just let you, that, <laughs> let you know that. Um, and I suddenly thought, maybe the reason that um, th I had this persona of this person or this being from, from Venus was that 
that being was incredibly competent. It's like not being tied to this planet enabled that being to be completely detached, completely dispassionate and able to act in this world where this other part of me couldn't. And that, that sort of dawning was a really interesting kind of liberatory opening up of, um, that just occurred to me as I had my, this, this hairdryer in my hand. Okay, now how do I flip this? <laughs> do I go like that? Oh, I do. Um, it's, it's also elongated my pictures, I think. Oh no, they just look elongated here, so that's all right. So um, I, I come from Victoria, which is that bit at the bottom, and um, the building on the right, that's where I work. So that thing that looks like a shard of glass, I actually work on the sixth floor there, and I'm really lucky and privileged. For ages, we, we, we worked in this... Um, we, we, we were always moving around. We were sort of like the carbuncle on the, on the edge of the health sciences building and we would just, um, yeah, we'd have to live in little terrace houses and stuff like that. So this is like the bee's knees. And that's where I spent a lot of time. Um, formative experiences, compulsory hospitalisation and treatment, multiple seclusions and the kinds of things you would expect that go with that. Um, annually over a 13 year period and, um, and for some reason usually in the month of July. Mm. And so that's the perspective that I'm speaking from today and that's the perspective I'm always speaking from. And I can't speak from any other perspective. Um, this, this quote is from Yasna Russo and I, it helps me to anchor what I want to say. And she says, this belief that we may be able to disrupt the common pattern might sound delusional, but for many of us, this will not be our first experience of being seen as delusional. However suspect and utopian the project of bringing our knowledges together to work on our own framework may seem, it also has the potential to bring us to a far more truthful and comprehensive understanding of madness. So that's really the kind of overarching way I'm thinking about this presentation today. And also, I can't claim to be presenting anything that has a middle and a beginning and an end. It's more of a palette um, of ideas. And these are the ideas that I'll try and... I can't do justice to them either. So they'll be sort of... Um, really introductions and, and I guess the link will be kind of hopefully being able to explain why I think that these are, are, are interesting and helpful, at least to me. So epistemic injustice, uh, mental health legislation as a form of structural violence, thinking about autonomy in different ways, the idea of ethical loneliness, the complicated um, idea, I think, of social, psychosocial disability in terms of overall disability, and this idea of um, magic or enchantment. So for those of you who haven't come across Fricka's work, she's just really interesting in terms of being able to um, help us think through some stuff, and I guess particularly around being um, a group of people whose testimony is, is doubted, so mad people, testimonies, you know, we, um, we're constructed as being violent or manipulative, um, we're li we lie, we're, we're mistaken and we're not to be trusted. Um, so testimonial, um, uh, sorry, epistemic injustice has these two parts. Testimonial occurs when a prejudice causes a hearer to give a deflated level of credibility to a speaker's word. And hermeneutic injustice occurs in the backdrop of a culture where the culture doesn't even have a critical concept to make sense of a group or individual's experience. And epistemic credence is essential to achieving human value. So this is a big deal, what we're talking about, according to this kind of um, framework. And my argument is going to be that um, hermeneutic Injustice, I'll just flip to the next slide. Excuse me. Yeah. What's um, in terms of this, I can only sort of explain that in terms of this particular, 
yeah, concept. It's the idea that there is no explanation out there for a concept. So, if, for example, it's um, you're living in a time that doesn't have a concept around domestic violence to explain violence towards women. It's that pre kind of idea of there not being an there not being a concept. And what I want to argue is that <coughs> in terms of mental health legislation and what that does to people. There isn't even a concept out there. There is kind of in this room, but that kind of out there, out there, it isn't really seen as a human rights issue in the way that I think it needs to be. So does that kind of start to make a path? Sorry. I'm very nervous, I have to say. Um, okay. So now onto this idea of what structural violence it's this idea of the avoidable insults to basic human needs and more generally to life, and it lowers the need, sorry, lowers um, the real level of need satisfaction below what is possible. So basically, what will happen is that, you know, people, um, poorer people, people who don't have access to privilege, who are less privileged, um, structural violence impacts badly on, on that group of people, whoever they are, whether it's, you know, um, so socioeconomic or whatever. And I'm saying that I actually wonder what happens when we regard mental health legislation as a form of structural violence. And I'm putting in, bra in brackets, this is where I'm trying to really get the point across, that I think that's, that could be seen as a form of hermeneutic injustice. We don't have the concept out there yet. And what I'm saying is that there's a discrimination when systems for medical decision making, when we compare that between physical and um, and uh, mental decision making, there's there are di there's a difference. So we can argue that it's discrimination, and that in itself, for me, is grounds of thinking about mental health leg legislation as being discriminatory and therefore structurally violent. Also, it's a situation where best interests doesn't mean what the person would want. Mostly in psychiatry, that means what's medically driven. And that, again, is a, is a kind of a, a rationale or a, um, the, yeah, it's, it's again a discriminatory kind of um, underpinning of, of how we make decisions in health. Also, I would say that this is a hidden category of people. Um, Mostly we're described not as those people who are under legislation and those who are not, but we're described um, through epidemiological lines, low prevalence, high prevalence, or diagnostic lines. That fabulous phrase, serious mental illness, for example. So we're kind of hidden. Um, also, the violence of using legal means means that we, um, our autonomy is interfered with, and there's often no end in sight to that. So we have people, I come from the state, mind you, that I think, I don't know if it's still true, but we certainly were the, the leading state in terms of the world, in terms of um, treatment orders, community treatment orders. So we have, I come from that state, <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course that leads to real world violence. This is, you know, something that um, we know about assaults on our bodily integrity um, and the treatment that can involve things like seclusions and takedowns, which is when people jump on you and push you to the floor and inject you against your will, and then you, then you pass out. Okay, and so this violence, all of this violence that I'm talking about is seen as for our own good. So to cap it off, so this is, whoops, <laughs> I hope this equipment is water, not water sensitive. Yeah. Um, oh, you've got tissues. I don't believe it. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, and ultimately, I want to say this is not trivial. None of this is trivial. Um, to have that seen as, as for our own good is mad making. So, I'd like to argue that the link, oh, sorry. This is um, Ruthless speaking, and she says, I shall argue that the link between epistemic injustice and autonomy is to be found in the fact that epistemic injustice damages and unsettles a person's relation to herself, to her self-worth, as well as to her self-knowledge, both of which are prerequis prerequisites for autonomous action. 
And a person is autonomous when she lives in an environment or in a social context that in principle encourages her autonomy and supports the idea of autonomy in general. So I guess what I'm saying is that my, in my, I like to sort of explore this idea of epistemic injustice and what it does further in terms of our autonomy, that it can attack our self-worth and our feeling that we know ourselves. Okay, and here's another um, example of um, what I'm calling hermeneutic injustice, but it's by Jill Stauffer. And she's coined this idea about ethical loneliness from um, thinking about the work of Jean Amory, who is a um, survivor of a concentration camp. And while I, I know the dangers of kind of drawing parallels, you know, in, in, in that way um, where uh, the gulf is, is very wide and um, you don't want to be sort of appropriating concepts from something that is quite precise. I, I still, when I read this quote, I still feel it has a lot of um, resonance. So ethical loneliness is the isolation one feels when one, as a violated person or as one member of a persecuted group, has been abandoned by humanity or by those who have power over one's life possibilities. It's a condition undergone by persons who've been unjustly treated and dehumanised by human beings and political structures who emerge from that injustice only to find that the surrounding world will not listen or listen to or cannot properly hear their testimony. These claims about what they suffered and about what is now owed them on their own terms. So, Ethical loneliness is the experience of having been abandoned by humanity, compounded by the experience of not being heard. Such loneliness is so named because it's a form of abandonment that can be imposed only by multiple ethical lapses on the parts of human beings residing in the surrounding world. So you can see I'm trying to really flesh out what I think are some of the costs and losses involved in being subject to legislation that aren't perhaps necessarily apparent in, at first blush. But really, this is, I guess, a lived kind of experience, plus a lived experience of going searching, looking for concepts that will help flesh this out for me. So now, I'm turning to this idea of, well, how do you make social con contexts <coughs> which encourage our autonomy, how, how might we do that? And Anne Plum, who I, I was really interested to read um, a chapter of hers recently, she, argued, she says, I would argue that while we do have reason, conscience and agency, these are complicated by experience categorised as mental disorder that in some ways distinguish us from others. And I think this is something that I really want to now explore more in my um, in my adult years, <laughs> as I get older. Um, it just is a way of opening things up for me, this kind of notion, because uh, I think that there are some significant differences that I don't want to paper over around being someone who, you know, comes from Mars and is only here for the cats, for instance. What does that mean for my autonomy? What does that mean for what I need in terms of, uh, you know, a world that, or a context that's going to support my autonomy? And then Tamsin Knight says, society needs to accept there are many ways to perceive the world and it's how people relate to their beliefs and the world around them that's crucial to their quality of life, not the ability to think normally or rationally. And I guess we, we are in a world that kind of prizes rationality and is a bit afraid of other ways of knowing. And again, I, I kind of was having a little fantasy listening to what Bhagavad was saying. Um, around um, different ways of healing. <laughs> Time goes fast. Yeah. So now I want to talk about magic enchantment and the fantastic. And um, this comes from Jennifer Laws. And she talks about um, researching with people. Originally, she was, I think, um, she was working with a um, um, like a support group, support housing sort of thing. And she found when she was talking to people, this idea of magic kept cropping up. And she came up with this idea about researching in the field of mental health where magic is an ordinary part of the human world. This idea that 
the ontol big words, you know, the ontological uh, um, part of this is magic is an ordinary part of the human world. Without appreciation of magic, current ideas about evidence base are impoverished. So that's the epistemic, the, the um, epistemological kind of um, idea. And that social inquiry should expect to encounter magic and be designed to see it alongside the prosaic. This really, really um, excites me, this idea that we could have magic as part of you know, how we think about things. And that in fact it's methodologically necessary to be, or in, you know, in some instances necessary to be open to it. She says, if magical realism says everything is as real as everything else and we cannot be sure what is real and so we shall treat all things equally, then this offers a respectful and inclusive attitude towards the minority experiences and magical happenings that are often excluded from traditional evidence bases. She also says, magical realism as such opens a new mythical and magical perspective on reality, often with the effect of revealing to the reader what is strange and incongruous about the status quo of the regular world. So I'd like to know more, and nobody ever asked me, nobody ever was bothered to know what, about why, you know, why Venus, why the cats? The second strength, then, I find in magical realism is a mode of talking about intense or unusual emotional experiences without automatic deferral to the institutionalised authorities of psychology or medicine. I'll talk later of David, a former employee of a local public transport provider who must check, tap lightly with his knuckles, the walls and floors of his surroundings at intervals directed by invisible voices in order to secure the timely running of the northeast bus network and prevent the apocalypse. And I've had you know, similar sorts of experiences. So these, these aren't uncommon. They're often to do with saving the world. So this is my last slide. And it's about contributing to epistemic justice, so trying to offset the injustice. And I think, for me, part of that is about fully appreciating the violence and losses of mental health legislation. So even if we say it's necessary, in actual fact, the dirty features of that don't go away. We have to count those dirty features and to all of those um, elements. And realising that it's a hidden category of people who know that form of abandonment that can be imposed only by multiple ethical lapses. Could our autonomy be encouraged by people and places um, that are unsurprised by magic? I really, really am fascinated by, by this idea of being unsurprised by magic, whether it's delightful or burdensome, and creating spaces to explore those things that complicate reason, conscience and agency, like Anne Plum offers us, and expanding ideas about what kinds of social contexts will encourage our autonomy. And that's it. Um, thank you, Kat. Um, uh, so, I, I forgot to say, um, Kat had a serious bout of food poisoning and is quite um, just, just sort of up today for the first time. So, while Cormac gets Peter up um, on the screen, we um, I just might say to Peter, you can hear me, can't you? Uh, Peter, we, we have a, a timekeeping system here so that everybody can get out for their coffee. Uh, so I'll you know, hopefully hear the tinkle of a bell when I get the five minute signal. Um, uh, so, welcome Peter. Um, so, Peter um, has been uh, one of the uh, people uh, leading on uh, user-led and survivor research uh, in the UK, which has gotten a name for being sort of a world leader in, in developing um, ways of, for, for, to include and let people with experience of the services, psychosocial disabilities become creators of knowledge themselves. So, um, we just, uh, briefly lost your signal, Peter, to the screen, but we, you are there and you're live. So Peter will stay with us and he can hear us, but uh, we can see you now, Peter. So without further ado, Peter Beresford, everybody. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, first of all, I have to apologize that I can't be with you. It's for two reasons. One, I have issues around travel. 
But two, I actually have to be at Essex University today. Um, I'm teaching a session, and in fact, I'll have to speak. I won't be able to come back to the discussion bit at half past 11 to 12, because we've got to, we've got to meet with someone who's coming who ha has some access needs. Um, but I'm only going to speak for about seven or eight minutes, I think. So hopefully, if, if it's practical, there's some time for a word from your end. I'm really pleased to be part of this. Um, I need to say any word of introduction. This is a personal matter, but uh, I, live in, I live in England. Um, I come from England. Some of my family came as refugees from elsewhere. I don't want to do any special pleading for England. But, but very big changes have been taking place here in the last 10 days. Unbelievable changes, which have to change all our mindsets. These have been linked with terrible and and I think neglect and cruelty like a terrible fire killing many people from black and minority ethnic communities refugees which was all about government neglect but also a, a general election which changes fundamentally changes our relation here with politics I think the future a very confusing time but a time of hope and I think a time of hope for us concerned as mental health survivors, but also concerned with issues like mad studies. And I will focus say, briefly on mad studies as a relatively new development, which Lucy can tell us much better about, I think, the context of mental health and distress. And we know that the first thing about it was only published four years ago in Canada. Much has happened internationally since. Um, also, please check out the uh, Mad Studies Facebook page, and, and I hope join. And, and I don't want to say much, but I do want to start by saying uh, that I want to focus on my excitement about Mad Studies, its potential, I believe, to change things. I think the rise of right-wing politics, uh, a global phenomenon, which we've seen a challenge to in Britain now, combined with the increasingly assertive expansion of the psychiatric system, have worked to stifle alternative ways of thinking about understanding, responding to distress. They've formed, I think, a powerful, informal, ongoing alliance that focuses on the individual, their responsibility and blame as seen for their problem the assumption of things being wrong in us, our heads. And I think that MAD studies have an unprecedented possibility, capacity, to challenge this status quo, which I believe is a damaging and destructive and human status quo. And it's global, a global phenomenon. Uh, it has the capacity to move us from a narrow, mechanized, individualized model or understanding to look us up in our different roles, experience, and standpoints, to give equal priority, I believe, to user knowledges, which we've been and experience, to be over reliance on professional and medical authority and expertise. Now, I should say, we've seen a, a reference to her already that I, I feel, in a sort of way, inseparable from Yasna. Russo, from whom I've learned a lot. So these things I have to say are in debt to Yasna. Uh, and when I'm thinking of this, I want to stress, I feel that nobody, none of us owns mad studies. We may all understand it in different ways. But for me, what's critical about it, what defines the key elements of mad studies are these two things. First, it is definitely seeking to divorce us and it from a bar. other disciplines coming than medical terms. Sociology, anthropology, social work, cultural studies, queer studies, history, disability studies, everything. Second, an emphasis it places on what I should call first hand, first person knowledge. Centering on Can everybody first hear that okay? No, okay, let's cut that, shall we? Oh, sorry. Let's get it together. I'm so sorry, Peter. Um, every um, second word is, is dropping. Um, 
So do I need to give up? Yeah. <laughs> That's from our sound person. And, um, I'm we, really sorry. And the audience is... No, I, I make requests. If we try with the sound, just the sound, Peter. We, I, can, I can send you what I've written. If you hang on, we've just got to try and lose... If we lose the picture, the sound might work better. For now, just for your last... For your two points. He's got to stop sending. Oh, you'd have to stop sending the picture from your side. So just put it to, yeah. So do you want to try giving your two points again, Peter? Uh, I will, but I, I should say that the reason I'm not with you was initially an access issue. And I've learned from bitter experience that if you don't rehearse this kind of communication link, it never works. And I. <laughs> It, it is actually picking you up much better without the yeah. picture. The signal is stronger for the voice. I my concern about this before I started. And I think it's something we need to do better if we're going to be more inclusive of different points of view, not least the points of view of people, people who find it very difficult to be, to move, to be outside. So I'll go back to my, my, my two points about mad studies, and I'm really sorry that this isn't working. First, that it's definitely divorcing us and itself from a biomedical model. Other disciplines are coming into it other than medical dominance, sociology, anthropology, social work, cultural studies, queer studies, history, disability studies, everything. Second is the value and emphasis it places on first-person knowledge, centering on the first-person knowledge of everyone not just those psychiatrists. If you want to talk about yourself, then you have a ticket to do so, a right to do so. It's okay. It's accepted. This is positioned, situated. You can't be talking from nowhere. It's not just like psychiatry or even anti-psychiatry. Uh, and of course, treating survivors' first-hand knowledge a part of that commitment, but treating it with equality. Can people hear me okay now? Yes. yes. Thank you. But MAD studies values and has a place for all our first-hand experiential knowledge. That's the point. That's why I believe such a wide range of roles and standpoints can contribute equally to MAD studies if they are happy to sign up to its core principles. It isn't only us as survivors, mental health service users, but allies, professionals, researchers, loved ones, and so on. This, I believe, and it's, I think, special about MAD Studies, is a venture we can all work for together in alliance. But I do want, uh, and I haven't got a lot more to say, I want to turn to threats which I think MAD Studies faces and how we might overcome them. Because I think we need to be clear and honest about the threats, negative pressures which I think face MAD Studies. One. I think it's interesting how quickly it has become a very contentious issue. Interestingly, a lot of critics within the movement for more critical approaches to distress are critical of it, as well as the psychiatric mainstream. I wonder if that's, for example, been reflected recently in some of the discussions in the magazine of Critical Psychiatry Asylum. And I wonder if this criticism of the sharp response it's received is also to do with its, I think, particular potential to succeed. I think we must also be honest about the state of general knowledge about distress, which I think is far behind disability. For example, the Progressive Labour Party in the UK in its recent manifesto for a general election showed an understanding of the social model of disability, uh, had a specific manifesto for disability, but it's still framed mental health in the old and qualified medicalized ways. And other people identify other problems uh, in the way of mad studies. Uh, these have been emerging, for example, in the sessions that we've had in the UK. The damaging potential is, is a concern for people. The damaging potential of the academy for mad studies, the fear that it ends up as just studies that this idea of praxis, combining activism and intellectual engagement, 
is lost, as so often has been lost, for example, with the women's gender disability studies and development that have taken place in academia. And related to that, the risk, the threat of elitism, about which I've heard a lot, uh, linked with its active and academicization imposed by the academy, because where else will we turn that has any or resources for uh, advancing these ideas, but the academy is itself a hierarchical, restrictive, excluding, and elitist. With the worry that who controls my studies becomes a reserve for academics, leaving out others, leaving out, incredibly leaving out key issues of equality, inclusion, and diversity. And I think uh, the third point I wanted to make is division among us along what may be different fault lines, uh, perhaps because of its prospects of success, perhaps because there will be a rivalry for taking control of it. Between, and I've seen this already, I think, between survivors and others, in relation to taking on with real equality issues of diversity, uh, even whether something can lay claim to be called mad studies, uh, and people contesting right of something to be called bad studies. And I've seen that, for example, uh, with Rose Garden uh, and a review of uh, a concern that we shouldn't be attacking psychiatry. Uh, the difficulties that there may be in resisting uh, hierarchizing um, the, all the expressions of diversity and taking good account of intersectionality complexities. And while we may none of us want to claim uh, mad studies as our own, and there isn't agreement about it, there is a worry, I think, that if we reduce it to a meaningless consensus, what it could mean is that it ends up being as, as subvert, as subject to subversion and ineffectiveness as previous challenges, like those for user involvement, recovery, peer support, all of which we know have been compromised. But my final point is that we, all of us, but we as survivors particularly, not give up on mad studies, so it's going to be something for the academy academics, because perhaps some of them want to take it over or undermine it. We mustn't give up possibilities or the participation in its ownership we can have by accepting those kinds of threats. We mustn't surrender it as if it could only be an academic thing. I think we must fight to get under its banner to challenge the destructive aspects of madness, of maddening forces, uh, stress opposers, and the disempowerment and oppression of people, particularly but not only people within the psychiatric. That's it. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry about the technical problem. Thank you, Peter. Um, Thank you for those reflections. We'll talk again. Bye. Um, okay. Um, now I'd uh, like to invite Lucy to speak to us in person. Um, thanks for coming from... Um, Lucy's coming from Canada. Lucy's been one of the... Uh, people who've been really active in Canada and um, I know she has um, a lot to say from um, their experience in, in Toronto, the experience of um, activism over many years. Um, so I shall let Lucy take the floor and we'll... Um Thank you, I'm very honoured to be here with such a great uh, panel. Um, and a very attractive audience. Um, um, I, I want to say five things uh, in my presentation. Um, the first is, uh, despite the uh, attacks on human rights work uh, globally, I want to, one, uh, talk about the miracle of uh, the work that I do at an organization that has not lost its funding and is still able to do advocacy uh, in an organization called the Empowerment Council. Two, um, oops.
okay, so one, the miracle that an organization still does advocacy. Two, I need to trouble inclusion and uh, conceptions of inclusion. Um, for many years, service users have argued for inclusion um, and for the value of lived experience and peer support as an alternative. However, I want to say that under the conditions of austerity and neoliberalism, the emergence of modern discourses and practices of inclusion, um, sometimes through concepts as, of peer support, um, are leading to the watering down and the erosion of advocacy uh, and problem solving that is very much needed to understand and revolutionize the mental health system in order to address some of the po points made by our keynote uh, speaker yesterday morning. Three, the erosion of advocacy uh, occurs uh, in part by uh, the under-examined under alliances between professionals and service users and the comforts afforded by a kind of growing conviviality between uh, service users and professionals that presumes that there's an equality and not power relations. Um, and I'll talk more about that as I go along. Uh, four, the rise of inclusive and participatory practices are often predicated on an individualized and singular narrative as opposed to collective ones. And I see this as a significant shift uh, that's impacting the way that advocacy can happen. So we're moving away from collective voices to individual narratives and stories. And five, my final point is um, that if you're, if, if you're interested in mental health, then I think it's really important to go and connect with the work of Mad Studies. Peter talked a little bit about that, but Mad Studies is, um, uh, it's a new concept, but it's based on a very, uh, a lot of work that has happened historically, a, collect a collection of work, and it has a key role to play in scholarly, theoretical development and analysis, but not just through that, it's also through the application of this theory through opportunities for mutual pedagogical teaching uh, and envisioning and resistance, uh, not just in the academy, but with grassroots organizations um, who are doing work. Um, I strongly believe that uh, protest is dead. Uh, we can no longer protest as we used to. It doesn't work. And so in order to find ways to change systems, we have to conceptualize and envision what that's going to be. Uh, so this is, can somebody pass my water, actually? Or my, or my water's just down there. So I work in an organization called the Empowerment Council. Thanks. Um, and the Empowerment Council is uh, an organization that exists within a psychiatric, the largest urban psychiatric uh, facility uh, in Canada. Uh, the organization is made up of service users, mental health and addiction, um, the staff, uh, the board members, and our constituency, our members. Uh, which is who we work for. Um, we're a small organization, so there's only like two of us and a part-time office administrator. And the work that we do there is, uh, first of all, the existence of this organization stems from early uh, grassroots work to have recognition um, and uh, a place at the table. So, uh, in the, in, the, in the 70s and the 80s when there was a lot of like activist work to uh, form a voice outside of the medical gaze. Um, organizations and people were creating um, movements to speak to back to psychiatry. So this organization stems from that history, which is actually very important. Uh, we've been doing work there for over 25 years. And um, Working in the hospital means we are working very clo closely with people who are coming into the hospital via the civil stream, i.e. the civil stream means you come into the hospital when you're a danger to yourself or danger to others. Or, and we're also working with people who are in the mental health system through the forensic stream, i.e. they've had an interaction with criminal justice, which can range from everything 
from like they end up in the forensic system because they kicked the tires of a car to um, they've killed somebody. Um, I firmly believe that as service users, it is very important to understand how the psychiatric system works currently, um, as it has adopted and co-opted progressive um, rhetoric. Our, it, our work includes outreach, education, and systemic advocacy. Um, <clears throat> obviously, having and understanding your rights when you're in the psychiatric system is very important, so how are you going to how are you going to share that knowledge with people who are in the psych system? What we decided to do was, um, through collaboration and talking to um, people who were uh, using the system, is create a bill of client rights so that when you come into the system, I, I was in the psych system, and when I was in the psych system, I had no idea what was going on. They locked the doors, and I was like, why can't I get out? The door is locked. I want to get out. Um, I didn't know what my rights are, and unless you know how to access rights, you don't really know what's going on. Anyway, so we created a bill of client rights. Um, uh, to help diffuse rights knowledge in an accessible way. Um, it took three years to negotiate the language of this bill with the hospital, but what's significant about this is that the hospital adopted the bill, so it's part of the way in which they operate. Every new patient that comes to the hospital has to get a bill of rights. Um, in, uh, if, if there's a language barrier, they have to get assistance with um, understanding their rights, et cetera. So it makes it much more um, concrete what your rights are when you're in the hospital. Um, and every new staff, like the staff that come to the hospital or work at the hospital, they have to be trained in understanding the Bill of Rights. This is kind of a big deal because a lot of places couldn't care less about sharing information about rights with patients. By no means is it perfect. By no means is the hospital like, you know, uh, championing rights, but I just want to mention it as, a, as an intervention. Uh, most importantly, like this is really good work that we do. What's my next slide? Oh, yeah. Uh, the interesting work that we do that I think is significant, that I don't know if there's a lot of other mental health service users or organizations that do this work, is we do a lot of legal work with lawyers vis-a-vis um, -vis participating in court and tribunals as an organization representing mental health service user voice. <clears throat> it took a long time to build the reputation to be able to do this, but now we have a reputation and we do it. So we have participated uh, by gaining something called standing um, at inquests, which means, does, does everybody know what an inquest is? When somebody dies um, through police shooting or in the hospital um, it's not a trial, but it's, it's an inquiry to determine how did the person die. So over the years, we've had uh, a, a role to play, which is called standing in inquests. Uh, and what we do is, when we participate in those inquests, is we bring client service user perspectives that would not otherwise be part of that legal narrative. Um, the same thing, that's a bit different than interveners in court because uh, we've also participated in court cases and precedent, uh, precedent court cases on issues of capacity, for example, um, cases that have gone before the highest court in Canada. We've had a voice there. <clears throat> this is, again, a fairly big deal because it's not every day you can get... There's a lot of disability organizations that participate as interveners in court, in court cases, but not a lot of mental health-run organizations. So. Um, it's a big deal that we do this, and uh, we've participated in numerous inquests, mostly about police shootings. Right now we're participating in an inquest of a, of a guy who was shot within 19 seconds by police. We participated in an inquest of a young 17-year-old girl who killed herself while she was in a um, detention center. Um, the core cases that we've, that we've participated in um, uh, like a, one of them had to do with capacity. Probably the most important one is uh, a case that we, a court case we um, intervened in that uh, was a challenge to something called community treatment orders. Community treatment orders you know, is when you're forced to take medication in the community. So you're not in the hospital, but there's legislation that says, I'm going to force Mary or Joe to have to take medications. 
we put a constitutional challenge forward to um, that, stating that it um, impacted Section 7 and Section 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, on liberty and equality, stating that um, the legislation was uh, un unnecessarily broad and was targeting people, and also um, uh, propagated um, uh, stereotypes that people with mental health issues are violent. Um, as part of that work, um, there were a bunch of interveners in that court case, which is like, again, this was like a big deal to challenge this uh, community treatment orders because uh, things are fairly conservative in Canada uh, and in the US when it, in terms of mental health. Like people do believe that if people just stayed on their medications and you forced them to stay on it, everything would be fine. Um, so it's not very popular to want to challenge that idea. Um, one of the interveners, not our lawyers, but another in, an intervener that was there for a disability organization did invoke the uh, CRPD um, as part of their factum in their arguments. And um, there's another court case I know of now in uh, British Columbia that's also in trying to invoke uh, the CRPD in a court case that's looking at um, patients challenging the um, the way in which the psychiatric institution forces medication. Um, what I want to say, the reason we didn't invoke the CRPD in our arguments uh, when we were challenging community treatment orders is because, uh, and we can talk about this as we have been talking about it in the last day or so, is just like, the problem with lawyers is that they, and judges, is that the knowledge that they have um, is the knowledge, is the sort of common knowledge that they learn, the way everybody learns common knowledge about mental health. So through television, through public relations, through sort of the way in which psychiatric hegemony, psychiatric power teaches people things about mental health. So lawyers and judges who you would expect to have really provocative, insightful questions, I was fairly horrified at some of the questions they were asking when we brought this challenge forward about community treatment orders. It's just that they don't know. They are fixated on pretty simplistic understandings of what the mental health system does, and those are the questions they ask. Anyway, we lost that particular case because, um, because I think the law is not interested right now in taking a risk um, and challenging uh, and understanding uh, the limitations of the psychiatric system, so we lost, we lost that case. But we've won many other cases. Yeah, and those are the, that's just the cases that I was talking about. Okay, so um, so this is like really good work. I think other organizations need to be doing this kind of advocacy and uh, uh, empowerment work. So I want to I want to trouble like the concept of inclusion because. One of the things we're, I think I hear a lot about is people talk about the importance of having um, service users and peer support in the system. And of course this is true and there are very good peer support workers out there who offer support in terms of like, hey, I've been there, I can relate to you. But what's happening with the rhetoric of peer support is that it has come, it has um, come to uh, replace I think, collectivist advocacy work. So what peer support workers are now being leveraged by the system to do is become the people who are managing other, other people in the system. So, peer, like, so another easiest way to explain it is the jailed becoming the jailers. Um, and this is attractive to institutions because they, appear to be doing inclusion. They appear to be hiring service users to participate in the running of the system. And this is true, and this is, this is happening, and it is good that people are getting employment. But what some of us have started to do is critique and question what is the labor? And furthermore, why is that labor attached to identity? So there's a piece here that I want to raise about, it is important if you've had personal lived experience of the system because you have something essential to share, but it is not okay to essentialize that identity and make it some kind of magical um, 
a centralized assumption that you're going to do wonderful things in the system. And that's what I think is happening right now. So you'll have a lot of peer support workers managing other patients in the system. Sometimes in the worst case scenario, um, uh, participating in the, in the use of coercion. Um, but you won't have peer support workers at higher levels of structural decision making. That has not shifted. That still remains our struggle, as it always has historically, is to be able to stru structurally change the system. And so I think this is something to be alerted to as, as, we, talk, as we figure out what do we mean about participating in the system and changing in the system, if, if you know what I'm saying. Um, part of this also happens through local legislation. I know um, the NHS and the UK has big, like a lot of discourses and, and talk about like inclusion and patient participation. The same in Canada and the same in Ontario, there's legislation that says, you know, in order for hospitals to receive their money, they have to comply with um, uh, the Excellent Healthcare for All Act and that act means that you have to consult with stakeholders and, uh, and partic like people who, who are stakeholders in the hospital. Technically, that's great, but I don't know what that means because, again, it's um, a very, uh, it's a process that's fixated on the individual and not the collective. Um, I've only got five minutes left and I, there's no way I can get to everything I was gonna say. But, um, I, so I think I just, I think I just want the audience to understand this idea that um, uh, there is like opportunity to do a lot of advocacy, but that there's a shift in the way people are organizing themselves away from collective organizing and much more into the singular narrative through, and that's being harnessed and leveraged through legislation and, and participatory inclusive rhetoric that makes it sound like you can um, participate and influence the system. And one of the things I want to end with is to talk about the role of MAD Studies in uh, being a site of where this can be challenged because with some of the critical thinking that has to happen around this stuff, um, MAD Studies seems to be for now the only domain in which these concepts can be debated and challenged and interrogated um, and that this becomes very important um, and, and a way in which to uh, realign a, a collective voice in trying to um, make social change um, uh, and, and, in, and in, an intervention into much of the language that's basically co-opted the language of revolution. So the words inclusion, the words participation, they've all been co-opted. So, um, and it's particular kinds of disability and psychiatric disability that are allowed to participate and are allowed to be seen and are allowed to be um, included. You will never find um, any kind of image or um, uh, perspective like from a group like Black Lives Matter uh, in, in psych the psychiatric system. So um, I think this is something that we need to pay attention to what kinds of inclusion are happening, who gets to be included, um, and uh, more importantly, are they accountable to a larger collective body? That's a very important piece. It, are the individual people who represent accountable to a larger collective body? That's all I have to say. I'm sorry I'm kind of sick. That's the best I can do. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Lucy. Um, I, um, I think we um, <clears throat> we could take a break now and come back for coffee, um, and then it's, well, some of the coffee is ready. Or we don't want to let you all out without. Um, so, what, Maria? What time is the coffee? You so. Okay. Um, so, we'll we'll 
we we want we'll take a break and I uh, we'll ask you to be back sitting down by 11:30. So um, thank you. Thank you.